Thanks for leaving the floors. I use he, they pronouns or anything respectful. Um, so when Nalini um, brought the topic to me around LGBTQ health and wellness, it's such a broad topic that really intersects in so many areas. So it's really hard kind of like finding panelists and also just thinking about questions in relation to, to this like huge topic. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panelists that we have here and then we're going to start off with a question that each of them will answer. Um, we tried to kind of, we have a few questions that will answer all the panel or will ask all the panelists. Um, but there's room at the end for all of y'all to answer because again it's such a huge topic that's really hard to kind of like hit every topic in a series of like an hour and a half basically. Um, so to my right we have Cecilia Villalobos. So uh, Cecilia, uh, she her pronouns, is the development coordinator at San Francisco Suicide Prevention. Um, Cecilia joined SFSP as a volunteer back in 2016 and became part of the staff in 2017. In her work with SFSP, Cecilia has gained experience in crisis counseling, fundraising, and research, researching suicide trends within marginalized populations. Um, Cecilia earned her BA in social welfare, also from UC Berkeley, um, in May of 2018, and is currently in their Master's of Social Welfare um, student at Berkeley as well. Um, so to Cecilia's right is Marion. <clears throat> so Marion um, Pellegrini is a family nurse practitioner currently practicing at San Francisco Community Health Center, formerly known as API Wellness, and also at Strzok's uh, Magnet Sexual Health Clinic. Um, he specializes in caring for people living with HIV, um, LGBTQ communities with an emphasis on the T, um, and uh, sex worker health. Um, he loves providing direct care, but also focuses on the structural details that affect access and quality of care from uh, that form research, charting uh, software to clinical protocols. Marion, he, they, uh, he, him pronouns, sorry. And then at the very end, uh, to my right, is Reina. So Reina uses they, them pronouns. Um, they are an Oakland native and a gender nonconforming Latinx person with a long history of HIV prevention work and uh, with other organizations such as Clinica de la Raza and Fruitvale and Colin Lord in New York, where they did outreach and prep work in black and brown communities. Um, they currently work as a prep navigator at San Francisco AIDS Foundation and continue their activism work in the East Bay around immigration and prison abolition. So, welcome all of our panelists. <laughs> um, so, we're just going to go down the road, uh, down the road, <laughs> uh, with the first question. Um, so, the first question is um, basically so, what comes up for you uh, when someone says LGBTQ? health and wellness, how has that changed over time, in your own lifetime, or in your current work? So, so where do you want to start off? Yeah, so uh, when I hear LGBTQ um, health and wellness, I unfortunately think of the disparities in um, health and wellness for this community, um, because I know there are a lot of personal struggles and structural struggles that they face. Um, in you know achieving health and wellness, um, I think recently things have changed because the LGBTQ community has been in the media more um, more often, both in positive ways and meaning like representation, people advocating for rights, people advocating for wellness, and in negative ways, in, as we've seen recently. Mm -hmm. um, so because the media and society has been talking about these issues more. Um, I think providers are shifting their focus and shifting their priorities to be more inclusive and to um, try to understand and integrate. Um, I think we've seen this at San Francisco Suicide Prevention a lot. We have more LGBTQ callers. Um, which to us is a good thing because it means people in trouble are reaching out for help. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's more of a problem. It's just people feel more comfortable in reaching out. Yeah. No, I think you definitely highlight the kind of mental health aspect that comes up when a lot of like queer and trans communities talk about health and wellness. Um, Marion, what would you say comes up for you when you think of LGBTQ health and wellness? Uh, okay, so when I was thinking about this question, this is actually a pretty 
deep philosophical question when you even just consider like what is health, what is wellness, what is the definition of the bad. Um, one of the things that I always kind of think about um, in, when, in terms of like framing health is the uh, World Health Organization has this very short but sweet um, definition which is uh, the it's, it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, which is a tall order, um, mm -hmm. I think, and um, has been criticized um, by a lot of the like medical communities um, because it's, it's that's very hard to operationalize and like. Um, it, you know, a lot of times health is and well-being is wrapped up in a, a functional um, an idea about how well somebody can functionally contribute to society, which is a very capitalistic sort of framework. But I think uh, one could also take this definition and really uh, apply, it, you know, come up with their own definition of like what is, uh, you know, a physical, mental, and social state of well-being, despite like how my body works or you know, any kind of health issue they might be contending with, like how they might find health within that. Um, and that function can really be self-defined, like how am I, you know, what's a good day for me? Um, so that's kind of like the big picture that I think about and when I think about um, uh, LGBTQ health, that is, um, again, oftentimes described in uh, disparities, which is a, a very measurable um, thing, but not uh, not really defined as in like what the actual like a healthy state might look like or a well-being might look like for a community or an individual with that identity. Um, and then another thing I think about is historically the barriers um, that people have had accessing health um, visiting loved ones in hospitals um, uh, and uh, just having their identity pathologized um, and how uh, we are we have been moving away from from that <laughs> um, but yeah I don't know big big broad topic I think I'll stop rambling there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, that's actually a really good question, one that I was like, oh my god, um, how are we going to talk about this? But um, I actually had no idea that the World Health Organization defined it as such, but I think it's interesting and I can very easily see the backlash, um, given that I strongly believe that our notion of health in and of itself is really centered around either pathologizing or producing bodies that are explicitly for like subjugation, domination, and exploitation. And again, that's a very racialized class and gender thing. Um, I'm going to move away a little bit from the LGBT and specifically use the term cutie pock or queer and trans people of color, um, specifically because that's how I identify. Um, and cutie pock, I think, when approaching this notion of health, can be a little bit more holistic um, and even radical because for me, cutie pop is not just a sexual orientation or racialized um, like subjectivity, but it's also it's also about um, understanding these identities and trying to exist in a completely different landscape that we currently inhabit, um, not one of accept being accepted for who we are and, and one of being able to access the things that exist um, because the things that exist will not help folks who are negatively racialized, folks who are queer, folks who are trans, and so we need something completely different um, when we talk about health and one of those things would be moving beyond the framework of your physical well-being, right? Because there's various components of health. Um, and many of them are ignored, especially when we think about environmental health, right, like the environment that somebody exists in, um, when we think about uh, our social health, the, the networks and communities and relationships that we have. Um, and it, I think it's a really in intentional and deliberate exclusion of those understandings of health, even though they're like very well recognized. But I, I, I think we leave those out because when we do that, 
were able to place the responsibility of well-being on an individual and absolve the larger structures, explicitly the state, um, in the in the damages that they create, right? And then we go to them and ex expect them to then kind of help, help us get out of it. It was kind of ironic. Um, so it's this like interesting cycle, um, I think. And so for me, um, again, I think the context of health is really important. And I think of folks, right? We talk about we want folks to be healthy, but we don't actually put that in practice. If you look at prisons. Right, like what does health look like for a person who's incarcerated? Right, when we know explicitly that prisons are not good for anyone, right, and they get even worse as you go down the line of like being negatively racialized or gendered um, or being trans, um, an immigrant, etc. Um, and so, so I, I really I, I think of those kinds of things and just kind of think of the ways that folks can be healthy or well um, outside of this like um, kind of like capitalist understanding of it and um, I think you know the work that we do at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation as well as in my own personal life work around harm reduction I think which is why that's really important right it's not it's not telling people oh don't do crystal meth because it's not healthy for you it's understanding that people are able to determine what wellness feels like and looks like for them and saying actually if you're going to do crystal meth don't do too much or test it to make sure it's not laced or drink water or you know do it with a friend don't do it alone um etc and um for a lot of people that would just be explicitly not healthy right um but that's actually not what's going to save lives and i'm not here for perfect health i'm here for less death um, and I'm just trying to, but anyway, that's kind of like my take on it. Um, and so I, I do think, you know, I do think it's really interesting. I think of my friend who's currently incarcerated, um, a sex worker um, who was incarcerated for allegedly killing his John, um, who, you know, is serving a life sentence. And something that he does at times is withhold, like taking his HIV medications, right? And again, he's in solitary confinement, gets in trouble for getting high. Um, we get like straight six months in solitary and so like what does it mean for him to kind of negotiate his health and wellness and his power in this larger system that's essentially killing him, right? Um, and making a profit off of his incarceration. And so, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of my little... I was very anti-health for a while. I was like, not everybody wants to be healthy. Because not everybody wants to be healthy and we need to be okay with that and we need to again understand that when we ask for people to be functional. A lot of times we're asking them to sometimes even prolong their death, right? They exist within this larger understanding of social death where they're completely marginalized or at least in part. Um, and so yeah, coming to understand again, some people don't want to be healthy and what we need to do is provide them the option to be healthy and to be able to opt out of that if that's what they want, not, not giving that option. So, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I think all of you have touched on different points that kind of show how complicated just talking about LGBTQ health and wellness really is. Because when you add in intersecting identities, like racial identities, different abilities, different immigration status, or a global context, it can look very differently. Um, so we're going to jump a little bit in terms of the questions, because I think uh, what Raina brought up and what you all brought up um, really talk about like health disparities and what that looks like. And I think um, like since we're at the LGBT historical society, like there's no way to take out the history component out of it. And when we talk about kind of HIV and AIDS work, the disparities that we're seeing were have always existed since the epidemic started in the 80s in terms of um, race, class, ability, all these different things that work in health and wellness. Um, so we know that kind of like black and brown communities, at least in the US, hold the brunt of a lot of the disparities, especially when it comes to the HIV epidemic, that has not changed over time. The closer we get to zero, the same populations stay the same, and it's young black and brown people that continue to kind of hold the weight of that epidemic. Um, so how would you discuss kind of health and wellness to black and brown communities or communities that are regularly told that their lives don't matter? And what does that look like? How do you support those individuals? How do you support those communities in your different like provider role, activist role, organizer roles that you have? 
If anyone wants to jump in. <laughs> So, um, I think when I read this question, the first thing that came to mind was um, making intentional efforts to provide outreach and awareness and support to these communities. Um, you know, whether that means on an organizational level being present at, you know, community events where um, black and brown people, young people are, you know, more likely to be present. Um, that's super important. Um, also, being able to have providers and clinicians who can relate on some level. Either they look like them or um, they share similar intersections or identities. Um, obviously not, there's no one person that like matches another person in terms of like experiences or stories or identities. But um, making an effort to have the people serving the community be part of the community too, and recruiting from that pool as well, opening up opportunities for um, more, you know, grassroots level work. Um, I think on a personal, individual level, um, I'm a clinician in training, and I worked or like volunteered as a crisis counselor for a long time. So I think being very intentional with your words and um, what you want to communicate to the person is super important. So explicitly saying, you know, your life matters to me has, um, <clears throat> it's helped a lot of people on the hotline. Um, and being able to build that rapport is super important. I also think, um, being very specific and in the ways that we approach things, whether they be HIV, whether they be uh, just health in general, housing, uh, employment, etc. Um, I, I think it's really interesting that we are moving to, I think it's helpful that we're moving again to this understanding of like queer and trans people of color, people of color in general, but again, historically thinking back, and again, this is because I mostly do HIV prevention work, um, uh, thinking back to like Latinos in San Francisco in the mission um, doing HIV work with like Proyecto Contra Sida Por Vida or Project Against HIV AIDS for Life. Um, these people were responding and it was a, like a HIV nonprofit organization that came out of a response of uh, lack of culturally competent care um, for trans Latinos, Latinas, um, and uh, gay Latino men. Um, I think. Uh, they were very specific in the work that they did. Um, they were focused on harm reduction, they focused on sex workers, um, and it feels like a lot of the things that are coming out today are just kind of blanket, right? Again, LGBT, like a lack of a racial analysis, a lack of a class analysis, and that always needs to be there. We don't need just an, like kind of this whitewashed LGBT understanding of like sexual orientation, because if we are specific and in including those who are, who are least represented and have the least access, we're inevitably, inevitably going to get everybody else, right? Like the white LGBT folks. Um, and so, you know, yeah, thinking about the work that we're doing right now, the Summer School AIDS Foundation, we have this initiative, um, QD POC at STREP, Queer and Trans People of Color at STREP, um, that's helpful, um, but sometimes, again, it becomes, for some people, they don't understand what that is. For the longest time, they've just understood themselves as Black or Mexican or Latino or LGBT, and so trying to introduce this term that I feel has really been catapulted um, since 2016, um, given you know our whole political environment in, in the context of the United States, um, I feel like again we're we're becoming more and more generalized, and again we just need more of that specificity. Um, it feels like in some components. You know, there are some, you know, we have the Center for Trans Excellence, right? We didn't have that before, that's like amazing. Um, but again, I think we just need more specificity and being able to name things as they are. In particular, saying, you know, black and brown people are most impacted by HIV, by other health disparities. Um, so yeah, just starting there, more things to the center. <laughs> um, I think um, in the context of like what I most like, so in like, uh, 
uh, healthcare visit, um, just someone has to make an appointment to come in in the first place, right? Or they're referred. So um, just like really starting and like by assessing like what, what brought you in today, what's your priority, and have that be sort of the, the focus of the um, of the visit, and then you know, of course uh, there are the check boxes that clinicians have to do to for um, the way things are structured on our end, um, but really uh, focusing on what it is that that engaged them in the first place. Um, and um, listen, have asked questions to help uh, articulate what um, is what their sense of what health is to them, or well-being, what would be important in their life. Um, uh, I think acknowledging anger and frustration when you know, because that's sort of it, it. My experience is sort of inevitable the way that, the way that healthcare delivery and access is structured. Um, can cause a lot of frustration, um, and by not bludgeoning people with fear-based messaging or um, gatekeeping, um, and uh, sort of like a authority, you know, saying that you take something away from them if they don't do this or that sort of task, um, and just keep inviting people back in um, if if they get busy with their life. Give them a call to, to have them re-engage um, and letting them know that you care about them and really mean that when you say it. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I think um, what you've all been talking about in terms of like access and culturally competent providers and services um, is really important when we're talking about kind of health and wellness in general. Um, but definitely when you add in like sexual orientations, when you add in race, class, citizenship status, all these different factors that complicate it and make it more difficult to find culturally competent and specific providers and services, um, make it harder for people to want to engage in that. Because if you go to your doctor and they don't see you and understand you as a person, then why are you going to disclose everything that's going on with you? Um, so I think when so the next question that I really have for the panel is when we're thinking about access and we're thinking about culturally competent work, um, what are some strategies or what are things that you've learned to really keep those kind of communities who have barriers to access or, or at risk or, um, uh, or being affected by different disparities engaged in the services or having them advocate on their own behalf to really be able to access the services that y'all provide that your networks provide and whether that's like as a provider or just as a community member and really talking to your peers. So um, at San Francisco Suicide Prevention, um, we have a youth program and it's a really great program we train like 25% of the youth in San Francisco in middle schools and high schools um, in suicide prevention, crisis management um, techniques. And we also um, teach them to like spot signs of suicide and like emotional distress in others, but also in themselves. And we help them um, gain the tools to empower themselves, to help themselves and to help their peers or community. Um, so, since we started this program um, in 2010, in 2010 we had less than 200 youth call the hotline within that year. Um, currently, within this past fiscal year, 2017-2018, we had 2,280-something youth call. Um, so, it's really important to um, I guess target prevention efforts too. So not only help someone when they're in trouble, but also you know teach them how to prevent that trouble or um, what to do if this situation arises. Um, and at the hotline too, I this sounds so corny, but um, I truly believe that people pick up on other people's sincerity and authenticity. So if you if you are 
authentically empathetic and compassionate and sincere when you're talking to someone. Um, you build rapport and they trust you. And um, if you have those kind of skills, like, um, you know, like if you talk to someone like you're talking to a friend who's coming to you for advice or something, um, people pick up on that and they're more willing to come to you on other occasions. So we have tons of repeat callers at the hotline, people who call back um, every time they're in trouble or to just check in and say, hey, you helped me get through this like really tough moment, thank you. Um, but a good portion of our calls are repeat callers because it's super important to be authentic and sincere and compassionate um, because people pick up on that. I think for different places, especially places that are explicitly like healthcare clinics, it can be difficult. Um, again, I'm going to talk about my work a lot, just because that's where I work. Um, and so we're a health and wellness center. Um, and so we, besides the clinical stuff, we also have like social programs um, and have things set up like legal clinics. So again, being able, thinking about like how can we keep, again, the clients that I mostly work with uh, on PrEP, taking HIV medication in order to prevent HIV. A lot of the times these folks, especially documented folks, have competing priorities. And so, you know, they may be just not necessarily engaging or adhering um, to the medication appropriately because of the stressors and everything else that comes with being undocumented um, in this country. And so, again, Felipe was one of the persons who was able to set up a legal clinic uh, for folks to be able to come in and get uh, pro bono assistance around those types of things. Um, and and so, and I think one of the things folks can do if you work in a place where you only provide clinical services is being able to set up a way to refer folks to appropriate programs and follow up as well. Um, and then in my personal life, again, because I think that's also really important, again, I try and do a lot of the work that I do at my paid job um, in my daily life. And so making sure that folks have what they need, right? Um, letting people stay at my house if I don't know them. Um, I'm part of like loose uh, online community networks where folks can easily say, I need grocery money, I need a place to stay, I need this thing covered. Um, and or I need this med, and I don't have insurance. Does somebody have a Xanax? Because I'm having a panic attack. Being able to, con and I know that sounds kind of off, and Facebook <laughs> actually also doesn't allow that. But if it's in a closed group, it's different. Um, so really, being able to show up for people, right? Sharing your housing, like not just talking about like let's push for Prop C, but Prop C is Prop C, right? Yeah. Well, push for Prop C, but in the meantime, people are gonna get this place. People are going to need a place to stay. Um, and you, we need to start opening up our homes. We need to make copies of our keys and hand those out. Um, even if it's people we don't necessarily know, we need to push our limits of comfortability because as long as there are people on the street, hungry, cold, being incarcerated, being criminalized, nobody gets to be that comfortable, right? Um, and it, obviously there's the balance and you need to take care of yourself because in order to help others, um, you need to be well. Right, well, uh, that's what I've been um, But uh, yeah, I really think we need to think outside of the box. And this, I think, is going to come up later. But again, a lot of the the healthcare rhetoric that we have it that we have adopted is based off of it's like healthcare is a human right, right? Again, like state based kind of movements or campaigns um, are really limited. And again. We need to really think critically of like, is the state actually going to save us or help us? Um, because they're really the ones that are doing this, right? The state could operate differently, but given the way things are set up, it's not going to. And they'll give us a few things to keep us feeling like, you know, the state is there for us, um, but it's not. And so what are the strategies that we can use that don't depend on the state, right? I mean, we're always going to exist within it, but again, like, I don't need like Prop C to pass for me to let somebody crash in my house, right? For me to give, buy somebody groceries, or bail them out of prison, um, or jail, not prison, you can't get out of prison, um, with like a community or a group of folks. Um, so yeah, just like, what are those things that we can do for each other? You know, buy each other weed, I don't know. But this is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really, really great point about um, just like, how these informal sort of networks of um, 
caring, self-care as being like community care, being there to pick up the phone at three in the morning to help people in crisis, because who, who's thinking about health and wellness when they're in crisis? And there's an abundance of crisis in many people's lives all the time, for sure. Um, what, what can I add to this in terms of um, keeping people engaged? Um, um, I, had a, I had a story. Oh, I think like a, a good example um, in some of the work that I do is like, um, it's sort of specific, but like um, when trans folks, specific, most, mostly trans women, come into care sometimes for the first time to engage in um, uh, primary care and access hormone replacement therapy, it's um, uh, they've been doing it themselves. They've been getting it from their girlfriends or wherever um, online and just doing their own research or not. And But just like going by like how it feels. And they're coming in to engage in care and access it in a, in a way that's a little bit maybe easier or checking it out. Um, and so um, in, in when, when that's in somebody's history and they come to me, um, I really acknowledge that as a form of self-care and um, and in terms of advocating on their own behalf, so it's like um, a lot of times I think it's really looked down on or um, considered, you know, when, when people act, do hormones outside of um, supervision. Um, I acknowledge their their knowledge of like how their own body, their own experience and, and go from there and and really frame the discussion as this is like a shared decision making. Like I'm here to like kinda walk them onto the labs, make sure that like everything is in like such safe um, ranges and whatnot, but that if they want to make changes or try different things, like just to talk to me and I'm I'm like totally receptive to, to doing that. And um yeah, that's one example of how um, I, I that was a really specific example about um, having, having people advocate on their behalf. But, yeah. <clears throat> no, I think you've all touched on kind of the barriers to access, and especially in the U.S. where we don't have universal health care, and that probably isn't in the horizon anytime soon. Um, a lot of the studies that were done around countries that have universal health care was basically the more homogeneous, the more similar individuals in that country looked like each other, the more likely that country was to get universal health care. Even in this room, we all look very different. So it's tough to say, like, if we step outside of this bubble, San Francisco is a bubble, the more different that people look, the less likely you are to want that other person to have rights. So at least that's been the general theme. Um, so what we ended up with was the Affordable Care Act, which was great in a lot of ways and complicated in a lot of ways. By taxing individuals that didn't have health care, it made it really challenging for individuals to really invest in it if they knew that financially they just couldn't afford whatever their premiums were going to be. Um, and even with health care, at no point in our socialization are we talk about the importance of it, how to utilize it, how to be your own advocate when advocating for it. And as someone who works in healthcare, the language that we use with health insurance companies, the language that we use with pharmacies, the language that we use to teach our clients about healthcare is very different than what people normally use. There are all these terms um, that are used just to complicate things and insurance companies create barriers for people to just access basic care, where you're told to go to one thing, then you're told to go somewhere else, and all these different things that I'm sure some of you have experienced already. Um, but what the Affordable Care Act did in a lot of great respects was really standardizing care so people weren't turned away for any pre-existing conditions, which are a lot. And before the Affordable Care Act, there were ways that health insurance companies would just deny you coverage altogether. It didn't matter if you had money, it didn't matter what it was. If you had a pre-existing condition, they could deny you based off of that fact. Um, some of the kind of important things that come with healthcare that people don't realize is that by having some form of health insurance, that allows your health insurance company to work with your provider to standardize the cost for different services. 
So if someone without insurance went for an HIV test at three different hospitals, they could be charged anything that that hospital wants because there's no one kind of um, advocating for the cost of that service to that hospital network. Um, another thing that it does, it kind of puts a cap on how much you can spend into your insurance in a given year. So if someone has no health insurance, they have an injury, there's no cap at how much they can spend into kind of relieving that, that cost. Um, versus if you have insurance, there's always a cap of how much you would pay into it in a given year. Um, so when we think about kind of access to insurance, when we think about healthcare in general, um, you know, like Affordable Care Act, with or without it, in terms of like how it's changed, how you think about and talk about healthcare, what are some things that kind of come up for you when you talk about it, when you hear about it, when you hear about all these barriers to access that people have in relationship to it? It's problematic. <laughs> I still believe in single player. I did before, I still do. Hopefully, we can have it in California soon. Some variation of it. I believe it. <laughs> Tax the rich. I believe that. <laughs> Yeah, and even thinking about like San Francisco and Alameda have programs specifically for residents of those counties that support undocumented folks, but it's just emergency services, some basic medical needs, but nothing holistic or substantial that would really get someone from point A to point B if they're looking for any kind of preventative care. It's really like if you get hit by a car, there's someone that can get billed for that. And that's great because insurance hospitals love billing people. And it also doesn't work outside of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you travel and you get injured, then that's all out of pocket. So I will admit that I am not really good at policy. Like there are a lot of big words and I try to understand and I try to study it in school and on my own and there are still a lot of caveats that um, I don't understand but I do know that the Affordable Care Act um, did bring behavioral health under the umbrella of um, services that can be provided and things that can be treated if you know you qualify for this insurance. Um, so that means, you know, if people have are covered under the Affordable Care Act, um, they have more resources in terms of like behavioral health care, therapy, psychiatry, case management. Um, but there is also, you know, the downside. Not really downside, but yes, actually downside. There's a shortage of clinicians for people who. Um, are like low income or low to moderate income. So often clinics will have like long wait periods for an appointment with a clinician. Um, but I think bringing behavioral health under the ACA umbrella um, was meaningful in that it was a step toward destigmatizing behavioral health needs. I mean, there's a lot of really great things that came along with ACA in terms of like prevention and services that like, um, um, uh, family planning um, and uh, I mean, a, a, a portion that is less understood and less talked about that is rolling out is actually like having providers be accountable for their outcomes um, uh, where they were gonna instead of just being paid for like a set price for everything if they consistently had poor outcomes like say for sur surgeries or whatnot like they their payment would be sort of um, adjusted by that and of course it accounts for you know high risk for types of healthcare like like sur surgeries different kinds of surgeries but um uh 
also something I'm not um, completely savvy about, like um, uh, where they're at in that, because I know that that is going to be initiated, I think, later on in, in the rollout for the ACA. And of course, everything is really up in the air about like whether or not certain pieces are going to even continue to exist. It's, um, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, around that, but um, yeah, I don't know, just trying to get people connected and get whatever they can get now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and even uh, with the last election, like there's, <coughs> at least in my networks, there are a lot of like trans and GNC community members that once the results were um, announced, were just like, I'm going to go through this surgery, I'm going to go through this kind of like healthcare system now, even if I was planning this kind of in a few months or in a few years because I am not confident that I'll have access to this in a few weeks or when this person is kind of, um, I can't even think, but in January when they like become official, I can't cuss. Um, but yeah, so we know that, uh, so I lost my train of thought. But, um, <laughs> Um, originally, um, we were going to discuss kind of some of the historical aspects of gender dysphoria and kind of how it's changed over time in terms of like trans and GNC communities. But I think given kind of some of the recent news that has come up and kind of the momentum, we kind of re-pivoted to talk about things now. Um, so, so we know that kind of schools that have GSAs and have QSAs kind of reduce the um, reduce even just like suicidal ideologies and suicide rates in those schools. Um, and we also know, like as we discussed, that the state and the systems and structures will not kind of set us free. Um, so even with kind of the potential legal aspects that are being announced or being thought about with this current administration, um, how do we kind of support and show up for our trans and GNC community members. Well, I mean, that first, I, I, this is been way on me a lot uh, recently. Um, uh, and, and, you know, first I just kind of want to acknowledge that, like, um, the rights I mean, there, there's de definitely been a lot of gains uh, in, you know, um, mostly in, with the uh, Obama administration, but um, in the last 20 years, people have been working tirelessly to have uh, little changes made that um, to secure certain basic rights. And um, uh, I think, you know, but still, still we see people being discriminated uh, legally um, from like jobs, housing, um, all kinds of services, bathrooms. Like that's uh, that is the reality in, in many, if not most, of the places in the United States right now. Um, so they'll have the idea that um, the big four, or whatever, like Health and Human Services, the Department of Education, Justice, and Labor. Um, Changing this language um, under the Title IX is is actually a big deal, and people are really terrified right now. So I think the first thing to support people is like you call your friends, acknowledge what's you know going on, like ask them, just tell them that you love them, and um, you're gonna be there to in whatever ways you can offer what you can what you can do for them. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I think that this is, um, I, I, and, you know, a, a lot of the headlines are, you know, using words like, um, erasure, erasure of identity, but in a lot of ways what it is doing is making people really hypervisible because they can't, if you can't get like a, an identification that matches your identity, your name, um, every, you know, there's like countless ways that that in, um, affects your life and how you live it, and countless ways for people to um, 
um, you know, oppress you and um, um, cause barriers to access for all kinds of things. Um, I don't know. I'm. This is a a, a huge a huge um, topic. I don't know too much about the schools. The GSA is like I can't really speak to that. Fair yeah. enough. Thanks for sharing that, bro. So, um, yeah, schools that have GSAs and QSAs have lower suicide rates and lower um, rates of suicidal ideation among students. Um, but there are all these much larger structural forces that are still oppressing people. Um, and sometimes it feels really, really difficult and impossible to combat that um, because any step forward, it feels like society on a larger scale takes two steps back. Um, but I think at this time when so many people are in crisis and emotionally distraught and fearing um, for their well-being, physical, mental, emotional, um, I think it's important to show up for people and what Faina said earlier really like moved me about not just vocally or verbally or like um, on social media supporting causes and um, movements but actually doing things on an individual level to help people in trouble means a lot. Um, so whether that just means asking like, do you want to talk? Do you want to come to dinner with me? Do you, how are you feeling? Um, specifically to suicide, side note, it's never, um, it's a myth that if you ask someone, are you feeling suicidal? You'll like plant the idea in their head or something. It's okay to directly ask because that opens up a door to honest conversation and they feel like they can trust you. Um, so it's, it never hurts to ask if you think someone is exhibiting some signs or symptoms. But even just generally, you know, asking how they're doing and being willing to have an open conversation and help in any capacity you can on an individual level makes a difference in that person's life. Um, I think on a larger scale, being part of community organizing, showing up to rallies, showing up to panels like this, showing up to um, events that really, you know, bring the community together to have a strong, solid voice is, you know, one of the best things you can do. Yeah, I definitely think we need to continue organizing um, and supporting the organizations that are, all, that are also doing the work on, on, on the front line. Um, and then I think, again, to take it a step further, um, supporting people directly with resources. And sometimes that means giving them money, right? Um, finding a way to do that, again, because the way nonprofits are set up, they're very limited sometimes. They can do like, like a, a cute little dinner or like, I don't know, a panel discussion, but they're very limited in being able to just give people $500 for the rent, right? Um, but we can do that on an individual basis. We can pool our resources. I do it constantly. People in the community do it constantly. And so I think, I think, I, I think it's also this very liberal mindset of having it, feeling better about giving money to an org versus and work that staff with people who are not of those experiences, who are college educated, um, who have degrees, um, who've never slept on the streets, and funding their salaries and their lives and giving money to uh, a trans Latina or like a homeless black youth. Because um, a lot of times people want to police what folks do with that money. Oh, are you going to use drugs? Are you going to go to the club? Are you going to buy nice clothes? You should only use it for one thing. And again, if we understand health and wellness as um, somebody's like quality of life or being in that moment, the way it's defined for them, maybe, you know, 
drinking and going to the club and buying a nice outfit is helping one to that person, right? Or maybe it does go to their rent. Regardless, it doesn't matter to you if, if you have the means. And sometimes even if you don't, even if you're left with nothing afterwards and you have the beans, lentils, or something, um, you still need to. Um, that was an inside joke. I do that sometimes to see beans, lentils, because I provide for others. Um, a little bit more than I have, but you know, sometimes those are things that we need to do. Um, and you know, with this whole thing that just recently came up with this whole narrow definition of gender or sex, um, I really think about um, the work that I've done with uh, different groups, different organizations that provide support to like trans and Latina immigrants, right? Um, Mariposa Sin Frontera specifically, where they would also fund and prevail people out. Um, of immigration detention centers and upon release provide shelter, provide you know housing for six months as well as payment, um, as well as taking them shopping for clothes um, that they need. Um, I really, you know, one of the things that came up for me was if trans Latinas, uh, and again because a lot of the work that I've done centers around this, um, also with Familia uh, Trans Queer Liberation in Santa Ana, um, if trans Latinas are able to make like a claim of asylum based off of gen gender violence as trans Latinas in their home country, what does it mean to completely erase their identity? Um, does that mean that they're not able to then stake a stake or like have a stake in being in this country, right? And and what does that actually look like? Um, it means people aren't going to be able to just show up and ask for asylum. Right, it means people are just going to somehow get here um, and be able to make a life without going through that process. And again, these processes are all problematic, um, but a lot of folks are able to get asylum um, and are able to live a better life here than they would um, in their home countries. And with that being something that's just taken away, it just feels, it feels really complicated, it feels really deep. Um, again, I see a lot of folks talking about like the, the gender thing in this very like white washed kind of way, where I'm just like, okay, trans Latinas have been, like, not, have been negated their existence and their ability to live here. Um, and then talking about, like, the quote-unquote crisis at the border right now with the caravan, but there are people that exist within both of these worlds. Um, there are trans Latinas in that caravan, and, like, what does that look like um, for them coming in here again? And it's, again, we're going to have to create these support networks where we don't necessarily depend on the state. Uh, hopefully, you know, it doesn't happen like to that extent, but that's just kind of what I envision happening. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's multifaceted. Um, there's a lot of ways nonprofits to say the government will not save us, and it does rely a lot on like peer to peer support, community activism, getting our voices out there, but really creating action around it. Um, so looking ahead, um, I think it's really hard for us to think ahead when there's so much stuff we're dealing with constantly and it's like every few days there's like another fight that we're trying to get through and it's hard to really recover from the last one where you just like put into the rain constantly. Um, and especially for folks who do have a holistic view of kind of like that center of queer and trans communities of color and really see that everything is in relationship attacking our, attacking us in a lot of different ways. Um, so where do you see kind of the next fight for queer and trans communities taking place around health and wellness? And I think even now, like when we think about housing in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, and we think of how inaccessible that is, and we know that the basic right to having a roof over your head or basic right to housing affects all different areas. It affects your ability to find employment, it affects your ability to like focus on your health when you're not worried about getting your stuff stolen on the street or um, all these other factors that kind of contribute to that. Like it doesn't have to be like health care focused because um, we know that's partially intersecting, but where do you see kind of our efforts being pushed into? I think question everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
So, I mean, uh, this, I had, uh, when I was thinking about this question, uh, my immediate answer was just like, where, where, everywhere. There's like, there's so many things and they just keep piling on. I mean, even this whole, the memo, it's not an action. It's, I mean, it's a, it's, you know, uh, but they, uh, one way, I don't know, to respond to that is in six months, if they actually even have the, they said they were going to open it up for discussion and public comment to actually go and comment, flood them with comments. Um, but it, I, in some ways, I feel like a lot of this is like a tweet that feels devastating uh, because you think that you know, so, you know, you're, there's a lot of things happening that are very concrete for sure, but like. I just feel like our energies are being pulled in every single direction right now, and um, focusing on like focusing, I guess, on um, specific concrete things that you can do to show up for, for people and for organizations and organize collectively. Um, yeah, there's so many people that need people to show up for them, and so many communities like. In, in many, um, it's like every every other day there's something new happening. So <coughs> the next fight. <laughs> yeah, I think it's hard. Um, it's hard to like think ahead about the next fight when you're still fighting like four or five right now. Um, and even some, yeah, like you said, Marion, are just precursors to things that may come up or may not. And a lot of the kind of like distraction tactics that this administration has done and a lot of the continued divide and conquer um, strategies that have been utilized in communities of color for like decades is just being repeated on a constant, like weekly, everything is just like, okay, now they want us to be against like detained children, and now they want us to kind of show up for like trans communities when we're still like, okay, these children haven't been reunited yet, and we're not talking about it anymore because four or five other things have just taken place. Um, so it's challenging. Um, so I didn't want to kind of end on a sad note before we open up to Q&A. Um, but so, um, what are two tips that you have for activists, providers, community members when it comes to supporting, uh, I'll edit a little, like queer and trans communities of colors, like health and wellness? So, um, I'm in an MSW program right now, and we talk a lot about um, cultural competency, but shifting away from cultural competency and into cultural humility, um, which champions the idea that you can never fully be competent in someone else's story or experiences. Um, so dropping the, I'm going to try to understand you and like, <laughs> whatever thing and just being humble and listening and being a learner and learning about people um, can be really powerful because I think providers, clinicians, activists, when there's a certain power dynamic, um, it's really uncomfortable to be the person um, being talked down to, um, like, you know, the other person knows better than you do. And leveling out that, or doing your best effort, or giving your best effort to level out that playing field um, by bringing yourself down and being humble um, is super important. Also, always listening to them. I know I know touched on it um, earlier, but really respect people's right to self determination. Um, don't be paternalistic or antagonistic. Um, just really provide someone with unconditional support and 
um, unconditional positive regard. I would say don't follow the lead. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> and give people what they need. And let them determine what that looks like. Um, yeah, I like, I really like the, the cultural humility aspect, um, and on an, on another part of that is the, like, really doing a lot of self-reflection as well, um, and understanding where your particular location is at in the relationship to the, um, the world. Um, and, I don't know, I think, um, And supporting other other folks, I think it's um, also important to kind of check in with yourself and see where you're at in terms of like what you can give and how you can be sustainable in, in that um, uh, act of giving and caring. Um, and you know, not be isolated in that. Reach out to other people. And just like if you start noticing. Signs of um, uh, trying to do self care, even like there's like oh, many times it feels like there's no room to for self care or to stop or you know there's a lot of work to do. Um, but cre create some sort of plan for yourself in order to like people to check in with um, ways that you can feed yourself in the. the Biologically, socially, spiritually, whatever is most important to you. Um, so. Um, so those are all kind of the questions that we have for the panels in terms of the questions. Um, but I wanted to open up to all y'all to see if you had any questions. Again, the topic is so broad and we tried to touch on different points related to health and wellness, but even it's just so much to dive into that you can just break up one aspect of any of the answers and really dive in for like hours on end. So it was kind of broad. Um, so if you have specific questions, um, feel free to ask. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think many of your organizations, or many of the wellness organizations in the city, are associated with the LGBT community. From years ago, many people that were on the down low, or even straight people, would say, you know, I don't want to get tested, or I don't want to go in for treatment, because they didn't want to become identified as an LGBTQ, or whatever, person. And it, there are a lot of people that actually didn't receive treatment and spread the disease because of this. And it happened in many communities. And I know today there are a lot of the communities, and it includes the trans and undocumented, they don't want to necessarily be identified as LGBTQ because of their parents, all kinds of issues. How has this been changing, and how do your organizations identify, even for a straight person? If I was a straight person, I would be uncomfortable going to strut to go to one of your groups, because I would think that that's a gay group. Or if I was a straight teen and homeless in the city, I would be uncomfortable going to the LGBT center to their youth programs. How do you reconcile this, or do you? So that's actually false. There is no empirical evidence to uh, prove that this notion of the down low um, led to uh, people transmitting HIV because of reluctance to be identified as LGBT. Um, it's, that's more of like a, a racist kind of blame game card. Um, so that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, I think there's a lot that we can say about the other parts of your question, but I do just don't want anyone to leave here thinking that the down, this notion of the down low, which has been proven to be false in terms of its negative impact on HIV, is a real thing. It's not. There's no empirical evidence. Unless you can cite a source, I just want to put that out there. Yeah. 
I think, uh, so I work in the HIV field and um, at the foundation and at Strut specifically, um, and with prep work as well, um, because HIV and AIDS was kind of seen as kind of a MSN, men who have sex men disease, um, that did stop a lot of people from accessing services. So we know that the rates in black women is higher than any other like group of women because the kind of idea that this is a gay disease. Um, and for people who may have been exposed through sharing needles, also like may think that it is a gay disease. Um, at Strut, um, originally, so Magnet is the sexual health clinic at Strut, and it was founded as a gay clinic. And over time, that's kind of changed because the needs of the communities have changed, the way that people identify has changed. So it went from kind of a gay clinic to a gay, bi, and trans men clinic to a LGBT clinic, and now it's just kind of a clinic of health and wellness for everyone. Um, because we know that not everyone identifies in kind of the ways that diseases are identified. And I think to Reina's point earlier when talking about naming the people that you're trying to support the most. So naming that we have like queer and trans people of color initiatives at Stra that really focus on black and brown communities because we know if we're just, we know if we're talking about kind of priority populations, it changes and the way that people identify changes. But if you kind of do blanket terms of like saying like LGBT or saying queer, you're just gonna catch um, for lack of a better phrase, the low-hanging fruit, which are kind of like the white LGBT folks who already have access to services and just want more access to services versus the folks that need the services the most, and kind of allowing that to kind of like, instead of a trickle down, really focusing on the communities that you want to, naming them and working with those folks. And we see that um, a lot of organizations have moved away from having the word AIDS in their like organization name. So like, um, AHP, which is now the Alliance Health Project, used to be the AIDS Health Project. Health Project, yeah. So even like little changes like that, or even like DBAC, DBAC, yeah, and yeah. from East Bay uh, AIDS Center to East Bay Advanced Care. So little things like that to kind of remove the stigma that people have associated with HIV and AIDS as being kind of a gay disease, even though we know that. Uh, young black and brown men who have sex with men are the most at risk, but may not identify with the kind of like generic terms that people use when they're trying to be holistic and inclusive and are in fact kind of deterring people who would benefit the most from the services. Um, so that's just kind of some hit, some kind of local things of what, of how names have changed and names affect the way that people have access services. Um, but I think being very intentional, like Rena said, of like, who are you trying to support the most, who's at the weight of it, um, will get the most bang for your buck. And API Wellness recently went through a name change too. Yeah, that was a rebranding um, because their services were provided to a larger, broader community, and I think that it was the Asian Pacific Islander and the title was people were like, oh, okay, not a bad identity, I'm not going to go there. Um, so that's why they rebranded to the San Francisco Community Health Clinic, which everyone's just like, what? <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, but yeah, I, would, I mean, I would echo, I think there are individuals out there that um, are isolated because they don't... Um, there isn't a group that really speaks to that. And I think that that could be many, many different identities of, of people. Um, uh, I think um, just talking with them and, and, and some services, um, you know, they're, um, we, we are continuing to build more and more sort of specific and, or even broader um, sources that are either more inclusive or speak to a specific population. I know that we're going to be having our first um, <coughs> um, trans-specific, um, uh, what's that name? I already forgot it. The positive force, the... Oh, trans plus. The trans plus uh, seminar, which is sort of like, um, uh, uh, trans folks who are um, newly diagnosed with HIV are, can come in and kind of learn 
kind of gain that uh, the language of to understand like um, uh, different health um, issues, um, how to dis dis even how to how to have uh, conversations about disclosure when they might be um, having multiple disclosures about their gender identity, um, their HIV status, um, and talk about how um, we're going to talk about how that overlaps. And um, it's being staffed by um, trans providers, so it's um, we're really excited about that. Um, and that wasn't really in existence, in existence before, so creating um, sort of a a network or a community of people, maybe, you know, um, keep just brings people out of isolation and, um, you know, not um, bringing people together so that they can kind of know that they're not alone feeling good. Um, so thank you all for coming. I want to thank all of our panelists. Um,